All right, thanks. Um, yeah, so um, this is, uh, stems from something that I've been interested in. I um, uh, started in my graduate degree. But uh, I've always wanted something like refinement types. And uh, I kind of reduced the problem um, to something like this. Um, if I could solve this problem, I, I felt like I had solved um, what I set out to accomplish. So we have this method divide. It takes A and B, a dividend and a divisor. Um, and uh, we just divide them. And we're providing this you know, to a user. Um, it works nice. Uh, so we can get like a quotient out by dividing 6 and 2. We get 3 back. But then some people decide to use it incorrectly. Like they divide 5 and 0. And they get an assertion or a, an arithmetic exception for dividing by 0. Other people you know, divide the mint value by negative 1. And it turns out overflowing, and they get you know a negative min in back, um, and so we need a solution so that people stop misusing you know this this method. Um, so there's uh, what I call the crash earlier, crash more often solution. Um, um, what we can do, we can just assert that they don't do this, right? Um, uh, and now you know the problem is though that if someone actually does do that, um, divide five by zero, they get a, an assertion error. So we've crashed differently. You know, maybe that's an improvement, I don't know. But we're still crashing, right? But now we also crash in the other scenario um, of dividing in mint value by negative one. So we used to just overflow. Now we crash both times. So this is um, the crash early, crash more often, or crash often is a catchphrase I've heard. That I don't really like it because the keyword is crash, and I don't want to crash. Um, so let's try a solution that doesn't, um, tries to get the program to not crash. I call this disclaimer solution. Um, so we'll just put a note that, hey, we're going to overflow. Also, we're going to annotate that this throws. And we'll call it unsafe divide, all right? So now when someone tries to use it, um, they can still divide, like, 6 by 3, uh, 6 by 2. They get 3, but they're scared about it, right? Because it's called unsafe. Um, um, also, they could still do the bad things um, and still get errors, right? So we don't like our unsafe divide. So we're going to try a no guarantee solution, but now it's safe. Um, we're only returning an option. Um, and we do our check, and you know, they might get an option back, right? So now we're safe. So if someone tries to call safe divide 5 and 0 and treat it as an int, or you know, try the overflow, you know, they'll get a compile error because it's not actually an int. It's returning an option int. Problem, though, is now if we try to call our safe divide, we also get a compile error because we don't get an int back. Um, so uh, we just call it dot get or else, I don't know, question marks. Uh, I don't know. So this works. You know, is that OK? I mean, the problem being, what if someone does something like this, where they do got, dot get or else when they shouldn't? They're going to get uh, a not in implemented error. So there's what I call a not smart enough constructor solution uh, based on smart constructors. Um, so you can get like a divide, um, maybe pass in this divisible argument. You know, what does that look like? Um, well, it's just like a class made with a private constructor. And you have like a factory method that doesn't promise to re return you a divisible. You can get an option back. Um, it has a non-zero. A non-zero is defined the same kind of way. You get an option back. So now if someone tries to divide 5 and 0, they get a compile error, which is great. Um, but if they also want to divide like a 6 and 2, which is safe, they can just do these dot get or else. And you know, now we're twice as scared because we're doing dot get or else twice um, with an exclamation or question marks. Um, so what about the unrefined tagging solution uh, based on refined? Um, so maybe we can like group these arguments together with like an int and then an int and non-zero. It's like a tag. And we tag the whole thing in divisible. And then the, the body is you know, taking out these tuples and dividing them. Um, so what is non-zero? Well, it's just an empty trait. What's divisible? Well, it's a type for what are these two things, first non-min and second non-min? They're just traits. And I've already, like, I'm not even going to try calling this because I already dislike it so much. Um, and uh, so I just reject that one flat out. Um, so this is what I call the, but I don't need this for literal solution. Um, Scala 3 has these new compile time ops. Um, and uh, they work kind of like nicely. So we're back to taking just two ints, but we need this evidence of being true that B's type is not 0 and A's type is you know, not the min int, or B's type um, is not negative 1. And if that's true, you know, it's all good. So we can call it like divide 5 and 0. We'll get a compile error, because that's going to fail this evidence. Um, if you try divide 6 and 2, that's going to work, no compile error. 
But now, if you try to divide like you know a random int by four, you're going to get a compile error. Um, but should we? I mean, b is four here. B's type is not zero. And then if we look at this other part that we need to satisfy, a's type not being min int. Well, we don't know that, but we do know that b type is not negative one because it's four. Um, but you know these. Operations are working in literals. They don't know this. There's no short circuiting. Um, there's nothing like that. So it won't let you call it like this. Um, so what, wish list, what do I want, right? I want constraint checking. I want runtime checks for unknowns. I want compile time checks for knowns. Um, I also would like to have some way to bypass, you know, if I really need to. Um, I'd also like, you know, users to be able to define their constraints. I'd like these constraints to compose, and I'd love some kind of constraint normalization. That's my wish list, you know? Um, so uh, let's try to do that. So what constraints could we use for divide? Um, well, we could maybe uh, invent uh, an unequal uh, constraint. Um, we're just gonna use it like this. So it has an A and B, and we'll use some JavaScript syntax, you know, as inspiration, um, the greatest programming language, JavaScript. Um, and then, we also need some maybe combinators like and and or. So it takes two constraints and ands them and two constraints and ors them. So um, we start to see a, kind of an appealing solution in my mind. Um, so we can now call divide, but we have to also pass it a proof that b's type is not equal to zero, a's type is not negative a min int, or b's type is not negative one. And if we can provide that proof, we can call this. Um, but how do we get a proof, right? Um, so here's our, here's our method. Uh, let's say we have A and B are both just random ints between three and eight. Um, this should work, right? Because A is not going to be um, a negative min int, and B is not going to be zero or negative one. So how about, uh, let's see, for our proof, we could just create one out of thin air, right? Um, so we're just going to cast a null as, you can cast a null as anything you want. So let's just cast it as this proof. Um, and this, this, this will compile and I won't crash um, your program. Um, it's kind of scary, though. Um, so what if we just hide this away behind you know, this trust method that takes any constraint you want, and it's just going to cast null as whatever constraint you pass in. Um, and now a user just has to call trust. Um, and so we've called trust here. And it doesn't look as scary, because we're not using null. We're not using casting. I mean, we are on the inside, but they don't know that. Um, and so that kind of works a, a little nicely. But uh, what if we have unknown values? Um, so. Let's, uh, let's create a type alias because it's, it's kind of long. So divisible is the same thing um, as our non-zero and non-overflow uh, values, um, but takes up less screen space. Um, so now let's say we have an A and a B that are both random ints, and we want to call divide. Uh, what are we going to pass in for this proof? Um, well, we don't actually have a proof. Um, so we need to do some runtime checking. So we can do runtime checking through a type class. Um, and in Scala 3, we can use like an opaque type, because really it's just a Boolean. Is it true or false? We'll make it contraver contravariant, because that kind of works a little bit nicer in Scala 3 with the, with the implicit rules. Um, but what that means now is you can uh, have a check method that as long as you take like an, um, an instance of some constraint, uh, I should have put constraint here, forgot about that. Um, as long as you have a, a constraint, um, you can say option dot when, um, you know, when that constraint is true, you can just trust it because you've checked it at compile time. Um, and so what that um, allows us to do is uh, we create some instances for this, con um, this check uh, type class. So we can get, take an A and a B, and if we can get the value out of them at, at, uh, uh, just by knowing their type, then we have a check of A and B. Um, and for our combinators, we can combine two checks, A and B, as long as we have check instances for them. We'll make the second one lazy for um, these, because an example of check A and B, um, we'll just call our Boolean check, because remember, these are just Booleans. Um, so we'll just go A and B, um, or A or B. And at short circuiting, we might not even need to check um, the B. Um, so now that lets us do something like we can divide um, A and B. Um, and we can call a check beforehand. We just pass in that type that we need. And because we have instances for that, we can now then match on that. And if we get some proof out, then we can go ahead and call our divide. If we can't get a proof out, then well, we have to have some kind of fallback. Um, and so that works. 
Um, but sometimes we have like known values that we want to divide with, and we don't want to have to check at runtime. Uh, we know at compile time. Um, so for example, we've, we're now using our d alias to divide method. Um, let's say we have a's a random int, um, and we know b is four. Um, we would like to call this because we know it's safe, because as we said before, um, the number four is going to meet this proof um, on B. So we can get compile time checking through inlining. Um, so we use a type class um, the same, uh, same way, but now our inline def, we either get a Boolean back when we check it, or we get null, because we're dealing with expressions um, when we have compile time checking. Um, so you might not be able to definitively say, hey, this constraint holds or does not. So that's why we have that or null on it. And now we can have a prove method um, that you can inline, do an inline match. And that means at compile time, you're going to try to resolve this. And if you can get a false out, then you're going to say, hey, this is an invalid constraint. We can make that nicer, but you know, uh, we'll just put a compile time error. Um, if you get null, we'll do a compile time error as well because we don't want to risk it. So we're just going to say, hey, this is unknown. Um, otherwise, we can just trust it because we've checked it at compile time. Um, and so uh, let's create some instances. Um, for example, our unequal um, of proving unequal, it's going to delegate to some class. Um, and um, this is what the class does, our override transparent inline def of a valid. And it's going to call into a macro. Um, and this macro, um, it's fairly simple. Um, and you just try to get the, the value out of these constants, a and b. Um, and if you do that, you can yield an expression of a Boolean. And all we do is we just summon this check that we've already written. Um, and that's the runtime check, but we're summing it at compile time. And remember, that's just a Boolean. Um, so we execute it at comp compile time. If we were able to get an option out of that, then we use it. Otherwise, we'll just use a null, saying we couldn't, we couldn't uh, evaluate that. Um, and so let's also create um, some combinators uh, that work. Um, so if we have a proof for A and B, we can just inline them. Um, and we resolve it all uh, at compile time. And this is like three-valued logic. So if A is valid. Um, we check that, um, and then we see if it's false. We can just say, hey, the whole thing's going to be false. Don't bother checking the other side. Um, other ones kind of work out. These provide falses are just provers that they prove anything as like false or prove anything as null, as unknown, or prove anything as true. Um, so now, going back to our example, if we have a random int um, and we're trying to divide by four, we can just call prove. And this actually checks out, um, and it'll let us do that because four equals not equal to zero, that's true. That second part of int not equal to int min value, that's null, because we don't know. Um, it's random int. And then that last part is true. Well, tr the, the null and true, they, you know, they simplify to just true, and then we have true and true. That all uh, winds up being true. Um, and just to show that it doesn't work, you, know, you can try to prove divisible phi zero, you get a compile time for not being valid. Let's say b is int from user. And now if we have a random int and an int from a user, we're going to compile error for you know, those being unknown. Now what about though accepting like sufficient proofs? So here's our same divide method. Let's say we have b. It's an int. It doesn't matter where it comes from. But we have a proof that also doesn't matter where it comes from. But it's that b is not 0 and b is not negative 1. Um, should this compile? Um, we would like it to, but it doesn't. Um, we get a compile error, um, and why is that? Well, it's because we provided a b-type not equal to zero and b-type not equal to negative one, but it's requiring this whole, whole thing where we have the missing or part, and our type system doesn't know that like and and or, you know, they, they're supposed to, you know, work in some magical way where only one of the ors needs to to check out. So how can we get that to work? So we can teach the type system proof subtyping by just using a match type. You're saying, hey, a proof of a constraint, um, if that's A and B, well, that's just an intersection of type, intersection type of proof A and B. And then or is just an or of those together. Otherwise, we just have a constraint. And now if we change all of our check methods to just return a proof of that constraint instead of the constraint, um, that gains us some intersection and union type um, subtyping. So uh, looking at our example again, 
Um, now everything type checks. And it's because this part in gray that's required is now just kind of like, it's kind of like ignored because we have one part of the union, which is the B type not equal to negative one. And the subtyping rules kick in, and that's a sufficient proof for this divide method. Um, and this also lets you now construct proofs and steps. So if you try to do a divide um, just like this, uh, we're trying to use divide in our defining of a flip sign. It's gonna take an int, um, and we're just gonna flip the sign. If it's negative, it's gonna be positive. If it's positive, it's gonna be negative. But we need a proof to call flip sign that we're not dealing with the, the negative min int, uh, or the min int, because if we do, and it tries to flip it, it's gonna overflow, and we won't get an int back. Um, and so because we have uh, that proof, we can then call our divide, and we need to somehow you know, join these proofs together of, we have a proof that negative one is not equal to zero, because we just have a literal, so we can just call our proof. Um, and our and is pretty easy, it just takes an a and a b, and it returns a proof of a and b. Um, another way you can model this is uh, if you just split up your proofs at the and level, the and term level, um, then you don't need to join them together. You can just pass them all uh, each separately. Um, and also, if you end up proving something like divisible, which is, you know, the both things combined, and you have them separated, well, you can just pass that into both, um, both the proofs because it's a subtype of, of both of them. Um, all right, so we can take this further um, by, let's say we want to expand our system to, you know, fully flesh it out to support all the and and ors that are, are typically used. Um, we can have a not that takes a constraint and it flips it, um, an XOR that makes sure that constraints don't evaluate to the same thing. We have a false that always, always evaluates to false and a true. Um, if we implement all of our, our type classes for runtime and compile time checking for these, then, then we gain them and we can combine our custom constraints with them. You can also write some type aliases like implies and rewrite them in terms uh, of what we've already, um, uh, already defined. Um, and so when we do this, though, we don't need to go back and add type classes um, instances for these because they're just built on pre-existing things. Um, and, uh, and then also what you'd like is you'd like these kind of equations to, de to normalize somehow. And we can use De Morgan uh, laws by um, having like a type of a proof um, we take some constraint and we kind of, we just flatten it out. So for example, a not not a, uh, a compile time, it'll return the type of proof of a. And you end up with a big long chain. So you can have these like nested constraints that all end up flattening out into a big intersection and a union type of just terms. And when you have just these terms, it's easy to pick apart in the compiler where, you know, the compiler will join together the ones that are alike. Um, and it lets, um, lets you do stuff like Boolean satisfiability. So for example, if you just try to summon that a proof of not out A is equal to A, then that'll, that'll work out. And your compiler knows that. Or if you have a proof that for all A and B, um, they're not equal to five, um, you can pass that as a proof that B is not equal to five. Um, uh, the subtype really rules work. Um, and then it even works for longer ones that I can't do this in my head, but it turns out a, a not A, X, or B is a subtype of A and not B implies not A or B. Um, and so now finally, if all this, all, all this stuff, we got to a practical refinement type. What does it look like? Well, here's an example of a non-zero. Um, it takes a value um, of some type i, and it needs a proof um, of that value dot type not being equal to zero. Abstractly, you can think of it as like a class of a refinement of some type a with a predicate on, on that a. Um, and if we do it abstractly, we can rewrite our non-zero as like a type uh, alias, um, like that. Um, and now we have our, our refinement type example of divide, um, takes an A and a B. If you notice, we've kept the no overflow proof because refinement types, they don't really compose well. Um, and it's a lot of times cleaner to if you have multiple types that have like dependent um, constraints to kind of leave that separately. Um, so if we have something like this, let's say A is a random int, we're gonna define some 
intermediate type i, so we don't have to keep repeating its value everywhere. Um, then we can get a b, which is a non-zero, given the i type, which will be one. Um, um, and then we can prove that it's not zero. This will compile because it goes back and sees the singleton type one and knows that it's not zero. Um, and then we can go ahead and call divide. And now we only need to pass in our non-overflow proof part because the non-zero proof has kind of been pushed into that non-zero um, type, refinement type. Um, so yeah, so, so to review, we have constraints that they're assigned by singleton types. User defined constraints, they, they compose together with type classes. Constraint validity is, in for, is evidenced by having just a trusted proof somehow. Um, and they're checked at compile time with just normal predicate functions. Um, and we can, construct, we can check them at compile time during the inlining process. And union and intersection uh, types, they form the Boolean equation terms. Um, and constraints are normalized by match types. And refinement types are supported by dependent types. And I don't know about you, but I, when I, I look at all the technologies that Scala has to model these things, I, I think, you know, I don't know if I'll ever use other programming language that supports match types, dependent types, um, type classes, singleton types, all, all these things that um, are needed to uh, make things like this work. I think it's pretty, pretty cool. Um, but, uh, so uh, some uncovered topics. Um, uh, what do you, how do you deal with tuples? Like they're kind of like a, a collections with dependent and independent constraints, um, and, and you can you can do that nicely um, because you can also get constants out of tuples um, if all the the parts are are constants. Um, Scala three is able to do that now with the no longer the twenty two limit. You can just have a collection as big as you want, um, and you can make constraint checking uh, generate additional proofs as well. Um, so. Right now, we, our, our system doesn't know that A not equal to B is also implying that B is not equal to A. But you can do that quite easily. Um, and, and it doesn't complicate you know, the user experience um, too much. Um, but there are some limitations to inlining composability. For example, they can't take like type class instances if you want to abstract something and have them create like a type class. Well, you can't get that type class instant value at compile time. Um, it doesn't compose well. Um, so mostly these things just work on primitives that you can, um, that users then, they, they just uh, work, uh, make their you know, classes work on primitives. And that works out pretty, pretty well in practice. Um, uh, questions that I've had. These are my questions, not your questions. So I have questions. Um, so what about custom constraint inference rules? Um, I see it kind of like a rabbit hole um, to proof writing and long compile times. What we like is an interface where they can either trust a constraint, check it at runtime, or try to prove at compile time. And uh, when I say prove at compile time, we basically just mean check at compile time. We don't want them to have to create all these rewriting rules. That, I mean, that's kind of towards dependently type languages, um, which I, I don't, I'm unconvinced that that's the right way to program at, at the moment. Um, another question, what about output constraints? So we just tried constraining the input, but what about constraining output? So you can do that with refinement types, and, th and they do it well, but the problem is there, there exist infinite constraints a, a caller might want to know about what they're getting from an, uh, the output of a, of a function. Um, so it's kind of another rabbit hole that uh, uh, kind of stay away from. Um, and then I just have this question, like, are constraints simply too bothersome um, for developers, right? Like, is this, is what we're doing too esoteric? Is it, it's more code? Um, and then there's just skepticism about, like, are there even benefits to things like that? And, and, and practice, does this really catch um, more bugs? Um, so, you know, future work, maybe I'll actually release a constraints library. I've been saying that for a few years, uh, but I might actually do it um, in the future, TM. Um, and uh, uh, Scala 3 also has these erase definitions. So there's, like, that proof argument that's not actually used, uh, we can erase that at compile time in, um, like after compile time in future versions of Scala. Some people want to make that implicit, um, uh, which I don't know how I feel about it, because you might end up proving more things than you actually need. And you know, implicit, um, implicit is used in that way are sometimes uh, scary um, for, for developers. Um, also, get this to work for Scala 2 would be nice. JK, I'm not going to even try. Um, we use too many Scala 3 match types, and I struggled with Scala 2 for years to do this. 
And Scala 3 coming out was just a breath of fresh air and, and it let me express things the way I wanted. I'd love to get in input from you uh, on this stuff. Um, I find it exciting, but maybe it's just me. Um, so that's all I got. Um, I appreciate, uh, appreciate you listening to me. <laughs>